Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to be taking a look at our passage for this morning, which is Mark chapter 14. If you can find a Bible around the church, although pretty well everybody should have brought one, I hope, or you've got one on the phone. It's Mark chapter 14, Mark chapter 14, verse 1 to 21. It's actually four passages. The first one is the one that I simply call the plot. The plot. The second one I call the anointing. The third one I call Judas's plan. And the fourth one is the Passover preparation. The Passover preparation. All these, uh, um, all these um, passages are quite small, so we'll go through them together. If you have questions, by the way, while we're preaching, then write your question down or save it till the end and put your hand up at the end and we'll answer them on the spot. How's that? That's a good deal, isn't it? Okay, but it's really nice to see you. Those of you who haven't seen me preaching in the pulpit before, it's an amazing experience to be here. Not only is it really easy for you to see me, but it's very easy for me to speak. And today I've got a sore throat, but it's amazing. The, the acoustics of being up here is amazing. But Harley, it's quite high up, isn't it? When you come up here, you think, I remember going to the swimming baths in Shrewsbury when I was young, and I went up onto the top board very bravely, and I went near the edge, and I went, the, the pool looked like a postage stamp. I thought I'd miss it if I fell. <laughs> so I went to the second one. I didn't have enough courage to dive in that day. Uh, I just jumped in. It nearly drowned me. <laughs> Good job it wasn't the top board I went off, and I think I would have been drowned. Okay, so, so you look ever so small, but the main thing is that you can hear me. And in fact, actually, this has been, this has been uh, instigated really by uh, Ruth and by um, David and others who just couldn't hear me. And that's because when I was preaching down near the carpet, that the sound wouldn't carry. Even with a loud speaker, it wouldn't carry. Now it carries beautifully, doesn't it? See? It carries beautifully. But I'll try not to blast you out. I just want to reach the people across the road, that's all. So then, we're going to take a look at chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. And it reads like this. It says, After two days was the feast of Passover and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. So what Mark is doing is he's giving us insight about what was happening somewhere else. Mark wasn't listening to this at the time. It's something that he would have got to know about later. In fact, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but John the Apostle was in some way linked to the priesthood in such a way that John probably would have heard this being said and would have told Peter and Peter would have told Mark and Mark would have written it down. Because you see, Mark had ac John had access into the high priest's house. He must have been family in some way. Notice it says, and the authorised version isn't really great here, it says, after two days was the feast of Passover. What he really means is that there were two days to go before the feast of Passover. Can you tell me what day it was when they had the feast of Passover? Who can tell me that? What day of the week? It was, it's always on a Thursday. Always on a Thursday. It's on a Thursday every year. You say, how can it always be on a Thursday every year? Why is the 14th of Nissan always on a Thursday every year? Because the way it works is this, is that before the first day of the month of Nissan, two priests, they go right up to the corner of the pinnacle of the temple, not to jump off like, the, like Jesus was tempted to do, they're very, very secure up there. And they look out for the rising of the moon. And they look out and look out and look out. And they might be doing this every day. But on one of the days, it rises and it's in the sky for about a minute and a half. And then the sun rises and it disappears because the sun obliterates it. And they would blow a trumpet. And they would call that day the first day of the year. The first day of the year. That's the past that's the first day. And not only that, but no matter what the day was before, it might have been a Friday, it might have been a Wednesday, whatever the day is before, that day they call Friday. You say, why is that? Why do they make the first day of the month the Friday? Well, let me just tell you that you, our, our, our race, all the humans were created on a Friday. 
They were all created on the Friday. The very first day that Adam ever woke up with Eve, the very first day was a rest day. <laughs> okay, not a work day. And the, the day on which they were created was a Friday. In fact, I think that God counts all time from Fridays onward. And so that was a Friday. So if that was the first, then what's the tenth then? Come on, we'll get a calculator out now, quick. It was a Sunday, correct? And Jesus came down that street on the Sunday, on the tenth. And the Passover is always on the 14th, always has been, always will be. The day the Lord Jesus died was on the day before the Passover. Because, you see, the lambs were killed between 1 o'clock and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon of the Wednesday. And uh, that evening, after sunset, they had the, the roast lamb for the Passover. Okay? And so what we're talking about here in verse 1 is something that took place on the Tuesday in the daytime. Okay? Tuesday in the daytime. And it says uh, Christ, re Christ returns to Bethany for the last time after this. You know, that in, in that Holy Week, Christ only ever went back to Bethany twice. He went back on the Sunday night. Okay? Sorry, he went back on the Sunday night. He went back on the Monday night. Okay? And on the Tuesday night, he was in the garden. So this, I have got that written down there. This is not the last time. This is actually the time before the last time. It's the penultimate time, the one before it. Now, the next six paragraphs, according to Harold Sinjin, my favorite Bible teacher, great man, never met him. He died just before I was born, but he's a wonderful, wonderful Bible teacher. He says this. He says, the next six paragraphs alternate like the black and white squares on a chessboard. And that's so true, right? He says there was the plotting of the priests, there was the pouring forth of the ointment. There was the plotting of the traitor. And then there was the preparation for love's sacrifice. And then there was the unveiling of the treasure of the traitor. And then there was the revelation of the covenant. But let's move on. That's great. I love that. I love this man. His comments are just so very precious. So this plot then to murder Christ was being hatched on this day, the Tuesday. Okay, and the religious leaders of Israel gathered together two days before the Passover feast. They gathered together on the Tuesday that they might figure out how to do it. But there were certain things they didn't want to do. They discussed how they could take Jesus by deceit and by craftiness to destroy him. But they agreed that they would have to try and avoid the feast days if they could because the people would be on holiday the city would be packed full of crowds that loved the Lord Jesus. And they were afraid of a riot in favour of Christ. See, these men were politicians. They knew which side their bread was buttered. And they knew that the people loved Jesus. And they knew that they hated him. And they needed to make sure they didn't get caught in the crossfire. Now... <clears throat> The rulers proposed, according to Harold Singer, another little quote here, the rulers proposed to postpone their action against Christ until after the feast, that for about a week. <clears throat> but they were in the grip of stronger forces than they ever knew, and their plans were dashed into spray against the rock of ages. Harold Singer has a way of words, doesn't he? Their plans were going to go all awry. They were going to be caught up in their own deceit and in their own false uh, plans. Now, the next passage, verse 3 to 9, is beautiful. And um, we call it, I call it, the anointing. Okay? Now, you need to be very careful when you're reading the Bible, especially if you're reading some translations. Be very careful because sometimes double things happen. For example, how many people were on the cross? There were five altogether. Right, you've got a cross-reference, you see. There were two that were crucified with him, and then it says, and after that, they brought two others who were crucified with him. Okay, so we, and there were two anointings. This is just one of the anointings. Let's read it together, and I'll point out these things to you. And being in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, 
there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now, it wouldn't have been a box like, a, like this box. It would have been a box looking more like that. So it would be a jar. And she would snap the top off, like you would with an ampule for doing uh, syringes. You snap the top off. And when you snap the top off, you can't then use it ever again. This was a one-off act of devotion that would never be repeated. She broke the box, it says, or I would call it an ampule, and she poured it on his head. It was an act of worship. So verse 4 says, And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? Okay. Verse 5, For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble her? She hath wrought a good work on me. For you have the poor with you always. And whensoever you will, you may do them good, but me you have not always. She hath done what she could. She is come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also she that hath done this, sorry, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for the memorial of her. Now I'm familiar with the authorised version, but I tell you what, sometimes it trips you up, doesn't it? Do you know, there's lots of people I want to I want to meet when I get to heaven. I want to write a book about all the people that are named, unnamed in the Bible. There's so many unnamed people. This woman, we don't know what her name was. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's so many, remember the widow that dropped two mites into the collection? No one knows what her name is. Nobody knows her name. You see, the thing is, you see, her name wasn't important. And she needed to be protected from retaliation from wicked people. Okay, but may I suggest something, that this is the greatest act of worship ever in the whole Bible. The greatest act of worship. There are other acts too, there's another one. So this is the second anointing of the Lord, this is the second anointing. It was in the house of Simon the leper, this is a leper that had been healed by Christ. And Christ is anointed by an unknown woman. Do you know, the world is full of unknown women. And I like what it says about her. It says, very simple, it says, she did what she could. Isn't that great? This is a church. There are people that need Christ. There's work to be done within this church. Come and do what you can. Don't bother telling anybody about it. Well, you need to talk to us if you're going to be doing something significant. But the main thing is this, that there's work for you to do. And she did what she could, and her little act of worship, as she saw it, was the greatest act of worship in the whole Bible. Isn't that beautiful, isn't it? I remember when I was a young man, like these young men here, I, I looked around the church, I thought, what can I do? What can I do? And I noticed that when the service was ended at the Gospel Hall, people used to mill around and go and have a cup of coffee and do various things. And I thought, I know what I can do. And I put all the seats straight. I put all the seats straight because they were all mixed up. And someone said to me one day, oh, you don't need to do that. I said, well, I, I, I'd like to do it. And they said, all right, if you want to do it, do it. Do you know why I wanted to do it? Because I was doing it for him. Just putting the seats straight. Occasionally he used to turn up, but this isn't blowing my own trumpet, you know, because he that bloweth not his own trumpet discovereth that his trumpet remaineth unblown. That's in Hezekiah chapter 4. So the thing is, I used to take me broom down, because I live around the corner, you see, take me broom down to the church and just sweep around the car park, because there was litter and crisp packets and all sorts of stuff. And nobody ever knew. You're the first person that's ever heard that I ever did that. Why did I do it? Well, it was unsightly, yeah. I was doing it for him. Do you see that now? And what she did is she came and she did a little thing as far as she concerned, but it was the greatest act of devotion the world has ever seen. Now this incident is also recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verse 6 to 13. 
The anointing is in contrast to the first anointing, which is recorded in John chapter 12, verse 3 to 11. Let me just compare the two. This is where it's important to know your Bible enough to be able to see differences. So let's look at the John the first anointing in John, John 12, it says it took place on the fourth day before the Passover. It took place on the Sunday, the Sunday night. This anointing in Mark 14 and Matthew 26 took place on the second day before Passover, the 12th of Nisan. That took place on a Sunday, this took place on the Tuesday. Who's going to explain to me they're the same? Anybody? Not the same. They're just two different days. In fact, there's a whole day between the two. Right. Um, <clears throat> the first anointing took place in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. This anointing took place in Simon's house. See the difference? Uh, the, the, the first anointing was Mary. The second anointing was an unknown woman. Right. Now we begin. The, um, the first anointing was a pound of ointment. A pound weight of ointment, that's very expensive. This one was of unknown quantity. We don't know how much it was. Uh, the first anointing was the feet of the Lord Jesus. She anointed his feet. And she wept. And she wiped the tears away with her hair. This anointing was Christ's head. Now the first anointing, Judas complained <laughs> On this one, all the disciples complained. <laughs> this one, they said it, it, it could have been sold and given to the poor. In this one, it says, why this waste? Why the waste? Let me tell you something. When you do something for Christ, it's never a waste. And no matter if it's a little act of kindness to some dear sister or brother that needs you for a moment, and they may never know about it, and maybe no one will ever know about it till you get to the presence of the Lord Jesus, and he'll say, thank you for that. See that? There was a, in the year that I was born, uh, there were a number of uh, martyred missionaries in Accra in, uh, in, uh, in South America, and uh, in the newspapers, they said, what a waste. You know what? If you grow up and become a missionary and give your life for Christ, it'll never be a waste. What happened there is this, that five young men who were absolutely brilliant young men, great preachers, great missionaries, they were speared to death. by a tribe of Stone Age men who didn't know what they were doing. So what did, the, what did the wife do? She went back to that village and then she won them all for Christ. In the first anointing, they said this is worth 300 pence. A pence was a day's wages. It was worth a year's wages in the first anointing. In the second one, there's no mention of the cost. You see, when you give something for Christ, the cost is irrelevant. When that dear lady put two mice into the treasury, right? We know how much they were worth. They were worth about eight pounds in our money. But that was eight pounds of all of her six months tithing. That's not very much at all. But there's no mention here of a cost. Because the greatest act of worship cannot be measured in human terms. It cannot be measured. Uh, it says in about the first uh, anointing that the Jews believed in Christ as a result. But about the second anointing, it says this. It says her act of devotion will be remembered wherever the gospel's preached in all the world. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have a few people get to know about it and praise the Lord? Or would you like the whole world to know? Well, she never desired for all the world to know. She never wanted all the world to know. She ne we don't even know what her name was. But the important thing is this, is the Lord knew. The Lord knew. And when I get to heaven, I want to find this woman and I don't even know what her name is. And when I meet her, 
I want to thank her for what she did for my Saviour. Now it says here, the King of Glory was anointed on his head. That's in Matthew and Mark. But he was worshipped on his feet, the place of the lowest servant in John. You see, the word Bethany means the house of poor, the house of the poor. And she came and she bowed at his feet, the place of the lowest servant, and she wept there. Let me just say something. We, we're, we're throwing this uh, church open for baptisms at the minute. Okay? And let me just say something for those of you that are older and understand these things. If there's never been a moment in your life when you ever knelt before the Lord Jesus and wept, then don't come. If you've never knelt, knelt at his feet and wept because of your sin, don't be baptized. But if your life has been touched and you have wept and you have worshipped him like that, then come and be baptized. What's the qualification for baptism? Simply that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus. That There's no inquisition. Those of you that want to be baptized, you can come and be baptized. There's no inquisition. We're not going to send you on a course or demand this or demand that. Nothing. If you have wept at the feet of Christ, then you can come. That's it. You can come. And this gift, of course, this gift this woman brought was given once and forever. You see, when you break the box, you can't put anything back in it again. You can't even use it again. It's broken. And, you know, I've got, to, I've got to put a challenge to you. What is it that's in your hand? Do you remember Moses standing there before the Lord? And the Lord says, Moses, Moses. And he says, what, Lord? And the Lord says, what's that in your hand? And he says, it's my staff. And the Lord says, throw it away. Throw it away. And he became a serpent. And then the Lord says, now pick the serpent up. But don't pick it up by the head like you should. Pick it up by the tail. Pick it up by the wrong end. Whatever it is that's in your life and whatever it is you're holding on to, throw it away. And if God ever lets you pick it back up again, you pick it up the wrong way. You pick it up his way. Won't bite you then and that became the staff of God not the staff of Moses it was with the staff of God that the Egyptian Nile was turned into blood it was with the staff of God that all the miracles were performed it's with the staff of God that the sea was opened now you see wow. so Christ in Mark reminds them that there that there will all be opportunities to do good for the poor. Now this is another challenge, sorry. I don't know what you do in your life and I shouldn't know this anyway. But I think that every single one of you, whether you ever let anyone know about it at all, you should be doing something for the poor. If you're not doing something for the poor, then what's your Christian life about? And I don't want to know about it. And you don't want to know what I do. But I'll tell you something. The Lord Jesus says you'll always have the poor with you. And you can do good for the poor whenever you wish. And tell nobody. That's what you should do as a Christian. And then he says, never let us think that we can do nothing. Never let us think we can do nothing. This woman did a beautiful work, it says. She did all that she could. Her name is withheld to protect her identity, but her deed is immortalized in Scripture. Wow. Wherever there's a Bible in all the world, this story is there about the woman that we don't know the name of her. Wow. There's so much in this, isn't there? So much that challenges us in all this. Have a look at verse 10. So in verse 10 and 11, we have Judas's plan. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad. And they promised to give him money, and he sought how he might have convenient, he might conveniently betray him. You see, this woman's act of devotion was the last straw for Judas. You see, the, the, the greatest feature about the life of Judas was he was all take, 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 take. 
He used to carry the bag that belonged to the group where all the money communally was put in together. And one of the one of the apostles, one of the disciples says, and he used to help himself to it. And the Lord Jesus didn't take him away from him. Why is that? Because that bag that he held was his moral responsibility before God. The Lord Jesus gives to every single one of you a moral responsibility. Every one of you has got something that you've got to do that's right for God. And if you're doing it wrong, I'm not going to take it off you and neither is he. Because he still expects you to do right anyway. But you see, Judas was a man who loved to steal from his own bag that he used to carry. A message for treasurers there, by the way. A message for treasurers. You don't steal from your own bag. Okay. But if Judas' life was all about what he could take, he met a woman whose life was all about what she could give. And Judas knew that she was a better man than him. And what did he do? He decided he'd make some more money at the expense of the Lord Jesus. He was going to betray him for a bit of cash. You say, how much cash is it? It was just 30 pieces of silver. In the, in the, in the law, it stated that if a man had a servant and uh, somebody else was working nearby and say maybe an axe head flew off the axe and hit him on the head and he died, then that man who owned the slave should have some compensation his compensation was 60 pieces of silver the lord jesus was betrayed for half the price of a dead slave that's not much in fact actually that's quite an insult quite an insult anyway he went to the chief priests and he asked annas and caiaphas to arrange for the betrayal of jesus Terrible, terrible, terrible thing. They were thrilled. They were thrilled to find a person who was near enough to Christ to betray him. And they promised him some money. And he went away to look for an opportunity. It might have been part of the bargain, might have been part of the bargain to stand as chief witness at Christ's trial. But Judas was long dead before that event occurred. His absence, in his absence, sorry, in his absence, false witnesses had to be found. He couldn't find any. Let's look at the next passage, verse 12 to 21. I know where time's going, but we're going we're gonna to take the moment. This is what you call extra time, okay, just to just, just let you know. Um, so in this next passage, we have the, pre the Passover preparation, the Passover preparation. It's Wednesday now, okay? It's Wednesday. The first day of unleavened bread. And they killed the Passover. And his disciples said unto him, Where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? See, they didn't know he was going to be dying the next day. They didn't know that. Even though he told them what I think, they didn't understand that. You see, this was the preparation day. It wasn't the Passover day, it's the preparation day, it's the Wednesday. And he sent forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go into the city, and there you will meet a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he goes, say to the goodman of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And there he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city, and they found us, he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Now this is the Passover in inverted commas. If I said to you, Joe, I'm going to come and see you at Christmas, what day is that? What day am I coming? No. I said, I'm coming to see you at Christmas. I didn't say on Christmas Day. Okay. So the word Passover then can mean the whole feast. Or it can mean the day, or it can mean coming for lunch on Christmas Day. It can mean a number of different things. In this particular case, it means the Passover feast, the whole thing. Okay? And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and as they sat down, they did eat. Jesus said unto them, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they all began to be sorrowful, and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish 
The Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it that that man had never been born. Now the Passover was the Jewish celebration of their deliverance from Egypt. If you want to know about the timing of the Passover in the Gospels, you've got to go back to Egypt to get the timing. But let me just move on past that. It seems that the Lord went to great lengths to ensure that the Passover, okay, both the day of Passover and the subsequent events would not be disturbed. It was secret. Only two of the disciples knew where it was until it was already arranged and set. And let me say, this upper room was actually on the upper story in the open air. That was the upper room. It was accessed by a stair on the outside, so you didn't have to disturb the people inside. You just went up on the outside, and there would be a tented structure, and there would be sheets over it, and there would be a table, and there would be all the... Th and there would also be the drink, the water. He's carrying the water, remember? There'd be the water, and there would be the... And there would be um, bitter herbs, and there would be everything provided for the Passover. That's where they held the upper room. And in Israel, every house in Israel had an upper room, every house. Do you know that? Do you know why that is? Because it was a commandment of the Lord that everybody must give provision for the poor. And so every house had an upper room and every house had a means of giving a place of rest and of recuperation and of feeding and of watering to those who were poor. What a beautiful thing. I only know one person in my life that's ever done that. He had a house, and he said, we have a room here, Stephen. I said, what's that room for? He said, that's for the poor. He said, oh. He said, if people come to me and they're hungry and they need to sleep, he said, we take them to that room. That's for the poor. Wow. And the two disciples, they made everything ready and led the twelve to the upper room. And the Lord began to say to them, that one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. And you know what, you know? They didn't look at each other. Isn't that amazing? Not one of those disciples said, well, I think it must be him. They didn't say that. Every single one of them was a man that was poor in spirit. Every single man of them was a man that was humble before the Lord. Every single one of those disciples, the chief characteristic of a disciple was an awareness of their own infallibility, sorry, their, their own ability to do wrong. And every single one of them, they were smitten by the Spirit and they said, Lord, is it going to be me that will betray you? Now that's the sort of spirit we need in our church. Not the spirit that looks down on another and says, well, I think you're the one that will betray him, but the one that will say, Lord, is it me that will betray you? There is such an awareness of one's own failure and inability to live righteously for God that every single one of them came under conviction and they all believed, they really did genuinely believe that it could be one of them. And so we see in the life of the Apostle Paul, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief sinner. Put your hand up if you think that Paul was a chief sinner in all the world. None of you? It doesn't really matter, you see, because it doesn't matter what you think. He thought it. He thought that he was the worst sinner. Now let me just say something. When you have an attitude like that, an attitude of utter humility, then the church will run really smoothly. Because we don't have any room in the church for preeminent people. No, we have room for people who are humble.